Hans Niemann is the most polarizing figure of the past 50 years in chess. Not since Bobby Fischer's disappearance, causing the United States to cede its world championship title to the Soviet Union, has there been such an uproar over a single player. Never has there been another player with millions of people accusing him of cheating, while millions more will come to his defense, at least not since Toiletgate. Today, we are going to talk about his story, his rise, and his controversies. Let's see who this man is. Is he a cheater or is he just a really good chess player? We'll find out today. We're gonna look through five of his games and this first one is one of his earliest recorded tournament games. This one was played back in 2015 when Hans was only 11 years old. Hans was born in San Francisco in 2003. By the age of seven, he had moved to the Netherlands, where he started playing chess at eight. Now, the story goes that Hans was so bad at chess that his teacher told him he will never make the chess team. To prove his teacher wrong, he studied harder than any other boy his age was doing. And it worked out really well for him. Before he left the Netherlands at age 10, he was invited to the National Youth Championship of that country. He then started playing in the United States in 2014, his first event, the National Super Nationals. This game in 2015 shows when he is already over 2,200. That's the ranking of the national master title in the United States Chess Federation. So here we go. Let's take a look at this first game. This first game was played in Reykjavik, Iceland. How fitting the scene of Bobby Fischer's disappearance, the last tournament game played by him there. So Hans is playing with the white pieces. And in today's games, I want to show you the full gamut of how Hans plays. He's known as an aggressive attacking player. Is that who he is? Or does he have a, a bigger and more well-rounded game? Let's take a look. So we're gonna start with a Bogo Indian. And this is all fairly standard. We got five games, so we're gonna go through this fairly quickly. I'm not gonna talk about too much, but I wanna give you the highlights to show you how his playing has evolved. So he starts off with a fairly uncommittal system where he's he's kind of transposing now to a deep on opening, but there's not been any trades and it's been a very positional start. We continue by seeing finally our first trade, bishop takes d6 and knight to c3, but fewer, uh, more trades are not coming soon. So e4, d6, rookie one, e5, rookie one, d1. This is the first real moment of the game. What is the, plan, the player's plans here? Whenever you have a closed center, you should always note that you should attack on the side where you have an advantage. Uh, black, clearly has more space on the king side while white has more space on the queen side thanks to this d pawn so with that being said white should attack queen side black should attack king side these young players did a decent job of that uh here hans immediately tries to play for b4 and he wants to play c5 the idea is when you have a space advantage on one side of the board if the lines open then the pieces can come attack a lot easier he is trying for that Hans shows us a solid positional understanding by maneuvering his pieces around and around and around. He just keeps going for a long, long time. And the position stays roughly even all the way until we finally see this move A4. And I know Black should be attacking on the king side. Black's clearly not doing that. He's an 1800. He's he's overmatched here. He's trying to probably just play very solidly. Um, but he plays a a5, and there's one little thing you should know. If you're getting attacked on one side and you will be faced with the opening of lines on the side you don't want, generally it's a good idea to open up one line if it's on your terms. Here probably we should have seen A takes B4 so that the black rook could have a little bit of activity. This might have kept the game even for a little bit longer. I'm sure Hans would have had more of his sleep. But as soon as an opponent makes the slip, Hans never looks back. He continues to press on the queen side until eventually his opponent actually gets something going on the king side. And Hans does make one small mistake. It shows kind of his youth a little bit. He goes queen to f3. Not really the best option. He should be attacking on the king side. Probably the best. I mean the queen side. Probably the best would just be knight c3, take on a4, and try to get the move pawn to c5 finally in. But Hans senses a little bit of hesitation from his opponent, senses a bit of an op open opportunity on the king side, and he attacks with queen f3. Then here, for some reason, black plays c6. Again, this doesn't make sense. Why are you playing on that side of the board? So Hans returns to the queen side, and now the c-file is open. He brings his knight in, 
and now Black's position is on the verge of collapsing. The D-pawn here is lost, uh, thanks to the two knights. Knight to e8 is going to be played, but this is going to allow for the other idea, queen to e3, to try and attack b6. Hans just continues to play very well. He wins this b6 pawn, uh, and it's at the cost of maybe allowing a little bit of activity for black, but this is, is nothing to worry about. It's just fine, and, and here Hans just up a pawn cleanly. There was a little trick, of course. This is the activity I was talking about. There will be a pin threatening to win the queen. Hans is too good for that. He's a chess master at this point, after all. He comes in with rook c7 now. Finally, the queen side attack can switch and transition to the king side, the ultimate goal of all queen side attacks. And finally, now the f7 pawn is a goner. He's up two pawns. He does lose one back to this nice tactic, but unfortunately it's losing because after bishop to h3 and king to g2, there is no way to avoid the checkmate. After rook to h5, he's shown us how great of a positional player he is. Now let's see his tactics. Give you a second to pause if you want to. White's brilliant finishing move, rook f5. And it's forced mate now. After the pawn takes, then you just have queen to g7. And if the king uh, goes to g4, you have queen g6 and mate on the next turn. Game number two. We fast forward from 2015 to 2017 to show you Hans in 11th grade. So now he's been playing chess in the United States for three years, and his rating is knocking on the door of that of an international master. In fact, later this year, or the next year, he was going to get the international master title. This game was played in florida in the grade nationals the 11th grade nationals here in the tournament he had a perfect event he won all the blitz games all the bug house games and then all of the major tournament the 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 reason they're there all of those games he said in an interview after that the toughest game was his fourth round victory he was also the most important because he was playing the second highest rated player in a section a guy named justin chen and he'd actually known justin he'd played him before and he begins to show us his maturing relationship with chess. He shows us a little bit of psychology use. So we saw his amazing positional play as a young child, and now he's gonna be playing uh, a psychological game, at least to some extent. He understands that his opponent, he makes some mistakes in the complicated mess of the game. Let's show you what I'm talking about. So he's playing white again. This time he starts off with an English, potentially a ready type system, which, uh, Continues with b3. You can tran you can transpose this here into a Catalan if you want to, just a standard d pawn opening. But he continues to keep things just a little bit more complicated, a little bit a little bit further off from mainline theory. So b6, bishop b2. All of this is very standard. D4 now comes. This is not the Catalan. He's avoided the mainline Catalan. Knight d2, c5, e3, rook c8, queen e2. He's just trying to make positional improving moves. We already know he's really good at that. And here he's he's just trying to up the pressure eventually hope that his opponent makes a little mistake in the calculations. Here he plays knight g5, which just, just shows he's not a perfect player. He thought that it was good to play, to force his opponent to play h6. He thought it was good to create a potential hook on the king side. Um, but he said afterwards it was completely useless. And now his opponent actually has a pretty good game so far. Queen a8, h3. Again, he's just trying to make moves and wait for his opponent to do something to middle where he's hoping he'll make a mistake. And finally, we see one capture, and then knight to e4. So far, Black's been playing very well. Again, Hans just continuing to play kg chess. He plays knight e1, just maneuvering, maneuvering, maneuvering. Hans plays this very nice move, d5. And as you can see, based on the evaluation bar, the fact that the bar is below this halfway point right here shows that Black has a small advantage. He's just putting his opponent in a tough situation to play. In this position, there's only two moves that don't immediately lose for uh, for black, or at least don't give white a big advantage. One of those is to take on d5. After bishop takes on f6, bishop takes f6, pawn takes pawn, knight to b5. And after queen d3, knight to c3. And this is a move based on a tactical miss. Knight c3 misses a beautiful tactic. I'll see if you can see it. So after rook takes, bishop takes, queen takes, you've given up two pieces for a rook. Why'd you do that? Well, the idea is to take on d5 getting rid of that strong central pawn. And here, Hans plays an excellent move. An excellent move. The best move, and this is the move that Justin overlooked, giving Hans a big advantage. And that was rook takes d5. The right way to recapture. Because now when the rook takes, the rook is pinned from the bishop to the queen. Hans is able to attack that rook and threaten the b6 pawn. Now, you can, of course, and should play 
c4, but this now loses the b6 pawn. And because the pawns are now separated like this, Justin goes from having a, a very promising position to a losing one. And he won, uh, or Hans won very quickly after this. He played a fancy queen takes rook because he's able to take back like this. And we've reached this two pieces for a rook position, but this is not even a question of whether this is winning or not. The knight comes to c2 to protect the a pawn, and now all you got to do is do the classic two versus one, which is where you first maneuver this knight over here to attack the b pawn. Rook goes to a5. We have a one versus one, and guess what? We're about to have a two versus one, in which case the rook will never be able to defend. The pawn will be lost. Then the next pawn will be lost on c4, and so on. The only thing that's stopping Hans in his position from playing knight d4 takes on b5 is the fact that the knight defends the a pawn. So here he comes up with yet another incredible strategy, strategic idea. King e f1. King e2. King d2. King c1. King b2. And 10 moves later, his king is now defending the pawn. And after knight to d4, he went on to win this game after another long struggle. I mean, it's not over yet, but it's going to be thanks to Hans' incredible precision. It's great play. So now we've seen Hans use both his psychology and his tactic or his uh, strategic skills to great effect against his opponents. After this game, he continues to rise up the rankings. He hits that international master and then he hits the grandmaster title. He's not slowing down. And he doesn't just make Grandmaster, he begins to push the upper levels of Grandmaster. Grandmaster starts at 2,500, he passes 2,600, and begins to approach 2,700 in September of 2022. September 4th, 2022 will be a day that goes down in chess infamy. It is the day where Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces was set to face off against then relatively unknown and rising star Hans Moke Neiman. And this was the day when Hans made a statement when he said his chess speaks for itself. Let's see that chess and let you decide what you think happened on this fateful day. With the white pieces is Magnus Carlsen. He starts off with d4 and we see a typical uh, Nimzo Indian setup. Again, we're not going to spend too much time on these openings. We're not going to spend too much time on these games. This is just standard stuff so far. Here, black has one upon, but it's come at the cost of being doubled and at the cost of black having uh, a little bit of issues with development, especially with this light square bishop here. We see pawn takes d4, queen takes d4, offering to trade queens. Hans does not decline, but he doesn't make that trade. And Magnus says no. Hans is not afraid. He shows he's willing to fight the world champion today. So this structure is good. You've got the two bishops for white. You've got an active queen. You do have one downside, and that is the c3 pawn is a bit vulnerable. It's on an open file, and things that can't be defended by other pawns are in general weak, and things that cannot move very fast are great targets. So c3 will potentially become a target later on in the game. The game continues on. We see more development. Here we see a trade of queens. Nothing too interesting is happening. But Magnus Carlsen does make this rather interesting decision to give up his two bishops advantage, his active bishops, to try and hurt the black pawn structure. Now he's saying, okay, not having the, the advantage of bishops versus the pawns, now it's going to be even. I have bad pawns, you have bad pawns. But the problem is, this is a bit of a misevaluation looking back on things, because this pawn is going to prove to be a bit more vulnerable than the pawn on f6 and the pawn on h6. The game continued though. King of one, rook d8, black's got great pieces, good development, good threats, good pressure. When it comes to d1, Han says no. He puts the rook on the c file, pretty much making the statement, my rook will be better than your rook. And we see the move knight to d2. In case you're wondering why not just jump right on down here into d7, this would be a terrible blunder because of the move with bishop to e6. Now the pawn is threatened. And actually this pawn on b7 is defended. The rook would have to drop back to d3 if you were trying not to lose the c-pawn, but that would rock directly into a fork. So Magnus cannot do this with his rook, and instead he has to play passively with the move knight to d2. And after bishop to e6, Magnus plays the best move here, tries to tries to wiggle out of this passivity that he's in because of this weak pawn, and just gives it up. Let's his opponent have it for free. 
Bishop takes on c4, knight takes, and rook takes. So now Hans has allowed the black rook to get active again, rook to d8, but he's up a pawn. So his Magnus will be able to, you know, pull out a draw and as he's so good at these endgames. Hans Neiman continues to pressure his opponent. He plays rook c7, the most precise move to prevent his opponent from going rook d7. Rook a8, a6, f5 proves the pawns a little bit, and now plays rook c5 here. Very nice move. Attacking the bishop, forcing the bishop to retreat, and then knight to c4. And after a4, Hans plays a great idea, a wonderful move. Knight d6. Absolutely octopying. Octopusing? O he makes his knight into an octopus that defends everything, attacks everything. His knight is an absolute beast. The knight defends and attacks all of the important points, and now his rook is going to be able to go on the prowl for more weak pawns. Rook to e7. Oh, wait. It looks like both of the pawns that are being attacked by the rook are defended. Wow. The knight is so strong. Pawn takes pawn. Oh, also, the e-pawn is defended. Oh, wow. Oh, that knight is so good. Hans playing beautiful, very precise chess. And now e3. Oh, how amazing. Simple stuff, but still important. e3, not missing a single beat. Now the point is, of course, if you, if you take the knight, you just instantly lose. And actually, the best way is not to take this, or sorry, not to take this pawn to win the rook, but to take the rook and to promote and make a queen. So this would be this would be the winning way for Hans. Obviously, Magnus is too good for that. He decided to take this pawn, and now Hans gets his knight into e4, another wonderful octopus-like square. Check, rook c2, rook takes e2, the pawns are falling, and eventually, uh, Magnus is basically offering a draw by repetition. You want to draw Hans? You've got to draw with the world chess champion here. Hans says no. Loses king out of the threat of the rook, potentially, and makes his intentions clear. He wants to win this game. The bishop drops over to d5, attacking the knight. The rook pins it. Check. Rook to d7. Knight back to g5. Check. Takes. Trades. Fancy rook trade. And now we get to this position, the beautiful knight to f1, forcing the king back, winning the h2 pawn, and then the e4 pawn. And this is going to come at the cost of losing both the queenside pawns, but Hans knows that after the in very important move, knight to e5, and then knight to c6, winning the a pawn. These two extra pawns will indeed be enough to win, and a few moves later, Magnus Carlsen resigned, seeing how the bishop has to move, allowing the knight to escape one way or the other, and these two extra pawns will win easily. Wow. He beats the world chess champion, and the world chess champion withdraws from the tournament, saying, I can't say why I withdrew, because I'll get in trouble. And everyone knew what he meant. Later, he came out and confirmed he was withdrawing from the tournament because he believed that Hans had cheated. Now, why would he believe that Hans had cheated? Was it because Hans played a really good game against him? Not really. Hans did cheat online. He had admitted to cheating multiple times online, twice, I believe, uh, or at least two separate time frames he was cheating. So he was known as somebody who was willing to try to go the extra mile to get a little bit of an advantage. He was willing to cheat online. And so it's not a crazy stretch to believe he would be willing to cheat in person. However, there's a huge difference between cheating online and cheating in person. And you got to understand chess tournaments really to be able to understand this. Chess tournaments, there is the peer pressure of literally having people walk around you constantly all the time. So it's not like you, you can you know catch your opponent looking away and let you look at your phone to, to cheat with because there's so many people around you. You, of course, are generally not allowed to have your phone around you at all. You are playing for generally a lot of prize money. So if you cheat to win that prize money, that could be considered stealing. You could go to jail for that. There's serious consequences. Plus, online cheating is a little bit more anonymous. If you get banned, you get banned. and Too bad. So that is a little bit of a stretch. But at the same time, he was also exhibiting an incredible rise from his start at eight years old to becoming a grandmaster at 17, to becoming a nearly a super grandmaster at the end of this year, he becomes a super grandmaster over 2,700, literally only a few years after that. So what's going on? Who is this? Who is this Hans? So he's got this huge rise all the way up to becoming nearly a super grandmaster. So he's rising extremely quickly. He's known to cheat online. 
Does that mean he's cheating in person? I mean, we can't figure it out. It doesn't seem like it. Maybe he's getting some outside assistance. And so Magnus says, I think you cheated. And then Hans was very angry at this. And he was, uh, he was, of course, unhappy. I mean, obviously, I would be if people were calling me cheating. So that's understandable. But Hans took it a step further. After Chess.com released a statement basically saying, hey, look, Hans, you didn't just cheat a couple of times. You cheated like 100 or nearly 100 times. Um, but we're also in this report going to say we don't think that there's any evidence that says you cheated in person. So we'll put that out there. But we're going to say that you cheated a lot online. So Hans says, I don't like that. And I'm going to sue Chess.com for releasing my report publicly. He said, I'm going to uh, sue Magnus Carlsen for defaming me, basically. I mean, that's really what it was, defaming him, saying that I'm a cheater when he says he's not a cheater. And then also Hikaru Nakamura, because Hikaru Nakamura was covering the cheating scandal in a way he didn't like. So he sues all of them for $100 million. And the lawsuit was stupid. It, it, was, it was frivolous, because you're allowed to give your opinions as long as you're, you know, you're not just talking about somebody randomly and accusing them of cheating. You have a lot of evidence, or at least decent amounts of evidence. You have a decent reason to believe that they cheated. You're allowed to say what you want. And so the case was dismissed, but Hans did get reinstated to chess.com and he did get Magnus Carlsen to say he would play him again. And so here we are post the Magnus Carlsen game, but Hans continues to rise. He is out there to prove everyone wrong. He says, I didn't cheat against Magnus Carlsen. I played a legitimate game. Now my game is more consistently rising to the level of Magnus Carlsen, more consistently rising to the level of the Super Grand Master and to the best players in the world. We now fast forward just a couple more months. He hits the 2700 rating barrier at the end of 2022, or really at the beginning of 2023 when the ratings update. It was much thanks to his incredible tournament performance in the Ball Chess Classic. One of his best wins in that tournament was against this guy named Nisk. I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, let's see how his game has now risen to the level of the Super Grandmaster. So we see a, an aggressive opening. We know him as an aggressive player. He plays the Sicilian, but it goes e5. This is actually, this is Shreshnikov sis the Sicilian. And uh, it is kind of positional, actually, because your goal is just go d6 and not really to attack right away. We see very standard moves, b5. Knight d5, by the way, a, a main move in the Shreshnikov because it's so... It's so positional. Um, forgive me if this is a Klashnikov. But knight b1 is actually a move here, which is so funny. Anyway, knight d5, bishop b7, takes, takes. The idea is white is going to get this beautiful pony in the middle of the board, while black is going to get potential counterplay later on, as we shall soon see. So Mr. Neat plays c3, castles, knight c2, a4, and now... Hans takes on a4. Mr. Nisk is just trying to attack the queen side, which makes a lot of sense. Hans is uh, very familiar with the plans of the structure, and he knows exactly what to do. So first off, he gets rid of the threat on a6, and then plays bishop to b7, threatening the e pawn. And after uh, losing the a6 pawn, he plays uh, the move pawn to d5 here. And the point is, while down a pawn, he is going to have incredible threats. A lot of development here. You can say that white is undeveloped completely, completely. Like all of his pieces are on the side of the board and his king's in the middle. So you can say he's completely undeveloped while black has a lot of development. Black has a really great game here if you can figure out how to break through before white castles gets his king safe. Queen b5, queen e7, defending the bishop. And now we see bishop to e2 and rook to a7. Then we see pawn takes pawn here. So the material is re-equaled. But the problem now after white castles is e3. Opening up the queen, the king side even more. After the pawn to f3, the idea is, is opening up this bishop so that the king side is more vulnerable. f3 and now e4. Absolutely insisting that something opens up. Pawn takes on f e4 and now queen takes c4. Threatening the tiny little, tiny little uh, threat of queen to g2. You know, small threat. Bishop to f3. Queen e7, defending the bishop again. And now we see queen e2, and bishop takes f3. The problem for white is he has not survived the, the attack. This has come at the cost of giving black an incredibly powerful e-pawn. If you don't believe me, 
Well, let Han's chest speak for itself. Rook to e1, uh, rook to e8 defending, and then queen d6, rook to f5. If you try to take on e3, this, of course, will uh, not work because of the move queen b6. Not because of rook takes, queen takes, and rook takes here, because that will get you uh, losing the game very quickly. So uh, the move would be queen to b6 here, and the rook is in trouble after the rook comes to its defense. Then the knight, of course, can be captured. You could also go here to try and win this rook yet again, and then play bishop to g5. So with that being said, white is in huge trouble, and he plays the move rook to f5, pretty much ignoring the e pawn, trying to get his own counterplay. Makes sense. And after queen to d2, here Nick plays king f1. And it's unfortunately simply losing now. He goes, rook takes a6. A beautiful sacrifice. And the game is over. Rook takes a6, queen c1. He resigned, by the way, in this position. But just to show you what would have happened if you take the rook. Queen c1, queen e1, and now e2. King goes to f2. And now it's made in one. Queen takes e3. And... Uh, Hans has won this wonderful game. So, this game finishes, and Hans is now over 2,700. He continues to rise and fall, a little bit rise and fall, but then, in 2024, he plays Hans versus the world. And he plays some of the best players, 2,700 plus grandmasters. He plays uh, one, of the, one of the top players in the world, Vidit Gujarati. He beats him 3-2. He plays... Anish Giri, we're going to see a game of his to finish off this video in a second. He beats Anish Giri. He also beats the French superstar Etienne Bacro. Let's take a look at this game against Giri here at the end to see what his game looks like in the modern day. In 2024, he played an extended match against Anish Giri. He won that match very convincingly, and this is one of the beautiful games that he produced. In this position, he uh, is playing the white side of the Sicilian, and he is not afraid to fight. Anish Giri is known as a very technical and very somebody who knows the Sicilian very well. And he gets a very tricky setup here with this also very uh, Klashnikov-esque d6 e5, Klashnikov-esque, but this is a knight or Sicilian. We see f4 and a4, and Hans is gaining space. He's, a, he's looking to attack here. Here he's... Not throwing caution to the wind, but he's he is playing just straightforward now. He just wants to attack. And these are the best moves in the position. King h1, very nice move, getting the king out of potential danger. Very, very good. Let's not forget, he's an exceptional positional player, just playing very good prophylactic chess. Finishes his development, goes a5, locking down the queen side. Potentially going to go bishop to b6 if this knight ever moves. We see Anish play rook e8, h3, and now queen to e1, signaling he wants his queen to come join the party. On the attacking side. After knight to h5, he goes queen back to f2. And he takes on f4. Bishop takes f4. Knight takes f4. And knight takes f4. Now the problem for Anish is that his f file is opened up. And there's a lot of major pieces aiming at it. So now, of course, the threat is to play knight takes e6. Knight takes e6 and potentially queen to d7. Maybe not immediately, but at some point very soon. So we see bishop to d8, defending the bishop. Knight d5, attacking the queen. Queen moves, and the queen comes to d4, centralizing herself, but also aiming at the king's side. Just Hans continues to play straightforward, strong chess, with, with uh, uh, knight takes d5, followed by queen b4, pointing out that you don't have to just aim at the king's side to have a good game. Here he's attacking the queen side. This was, of course, not the very best move of the game. This was probably his worst move, but it doesn't matter. He's still got lots of pressure, and Anish, even if the computer says it should be equal, he has a tough position to defend. After queen g6, rook f3, and rook to f1, we now see rook g3. Hans has not forgotten about the king's side, and he plays queen back to d4 when the, the coast is a little bit safer for his queen. He doesn't want to trade queens. And now g6. This is the moment where Anish simply makes a tactical mistake on another beautiful third time in this video. Example of Hans Niemann sacrificing the rook. Rook takes g5. Pawn takes g5. Knight check. Now that there's no bishop on g5, he can bring his knight into f6. And then knight to d7, winning back the exchange, causing black's pawn structure to turn into a mess. 
we now see his pieces get extremely active. His bishop goes to d5. His queen goes to b6. His queen takes on b7. Now he's finally up material. This does allow black to get a little bit of development, a little bit of activity against the king, but it's not going to be enough. Hans greedily munches another pawn, but safely. And then after queen c4, knight to h5, rook to f3. We see knight g3. It looks a little scary, but Hans has it all under control. F4, locking the knight into g3, maybe threatening. Now queen takes b2, queen c1, queen a1, or something like that. Here, king to f2. Just an incredible move to play. Very hard to understand why this move works. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. It's just the best move. Uh, he plays king to h7, and now pawn to c3. Uh, just to show you a point here, queen takes here on, on uh, b2. The idea was queen to c3, simply trading queens. And now Hans is up a pawn and will win this in game. So he just wants to keep the queens on the board. He moves his king out of the way. And then we see pawn to c3, queen e7, queen b4. And in this position, Hans rooks attacked. And for a fourth time, his chest speaks for himself with another rook sacrifice. We see queen b7, beautiful move. Queen takes, bishop takes, and pawn takes rook. You have to take, otherwise you're just going to be in a losing endgame. Pawn comes to d5. Bishop takes, and now we've got the super classic. Everyone is, everyone knows this. The four pawns versus rook position. I'm sure you're very familiar with how the theory goes, right? Anyway, the game continues and continues until we reach uh, this position. b4, knight e7, b5, and uh, rook takes c6. So it's at this point where... Anish is just desperately trying to make a draw. So he sacrifices his rook, hoping that his knight can stop all of the passed pawns. The problem is, these are not white's only passed pawns. He's also got the e pawn. And the e pawn, along with the king side pawn, queen side pawns, will be enough to win this game. And here, going back all the way to what we saw in one of his earliest games, he goes on a long king march. Threatening to bring his king to b6 into a7, the knight drops to a8. Now, if only the king could go to c6 and b7, it would be game over. Oh, wait. There's a pawn in the way. Throw it away. King comes to d7 to try and prevent the king from coming to c6. Hans says, I don't care. And finally gets his king to c6. The knight comes to c7, e5. And now the problem is the black king is forced to go over and defend the e-pawn. And as soon as he does, this allows the king to come over to b7. And in this position, Anish resigned the game because... After something like knight to c7 and trades happen, you will be winning with uh, similarly to this. That's Hans Niemann's story. He is an incredibly interesting chess player. He starts off at the age of eight, pretty, pretty late for a uh, young talent. And then he becomes a grandmaster at age 17, also pretty late. But he continues to improve, continues to work hard, and bypasses this game with Magnus Carlsen and this cheating scandal, tries to put it in the past continues to just prove his game playing in-person chess with some of the best chess players in the world and beating them. And now, thanks to all of this, he's inside the top 20 in the world. And we all know what's happening in just a couple of weeks from the time this video is being produced. Magnus Carlsen is going to take on Hans Niemann yet again. And we're going to see if Hans Niemann is anywhere close to consistently playing at Magnus's level. We shall see. Really looking forward to this. I hope you enjoyed this Hans Niemann little documentary. If you did, please make sure to like this video. Leave a comment telling me what you learned. I will leave you all here and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.